In this video, we're gonna be trying to fix this Hanimex Pong console. It's one of the many Pong console clones around in the 70s. And I got this one off eBay. The problem described was that it didn't output any image to the TV. And I can confirm that all I got was fuzz. So it seems to be broken. And so I got this off eBay for 25 Australian dollars, which is about 18 US dollars or 12 pounds 50, which I think is a great price considering the age of the thing, just because it's not a collectible console. Uh, these ones are often quite a lot cheaper, uh, despite the age. Now, of course, I realize it is broken, but still for 25 Australian dollars, I think that's a pretty good price. So I'm just gonna go around, do a bit of an inspection of the console to see if there's any other issues uh, that's immediately obvious. So we have our little controllers here with the uh, first, some of the first ever analog sticks. And it actually feels quite good. Now they don't self-center as our modern ones do, so it isn't broken, it's, it's meant to be like that. Um, Yep, this button feels fine. Then we have the cabling as well, which all looks attached and intact. And let's just check out the other one. Yeah, that looks fine to me, at least on the outside. We'll check if there's any issues a bit later, if we do get it working. Now, just check the switches. So I've checked that one already, the power switch. We have reset, which springs back up. Uh, and this is a programmable switches here that change the difficulty of the game. Then we have a serve, uh, serve manual, or manual I think, serve manual or automatic. Then we can select our game up here. Now these are like tennis, basketball, but essentially they're like Pong, just with the lines drawn a bit differently. There's nothing too different about these, these different types of games, even though it looks like a large selection there. And then we have these score sliders. So that all feels fine to me. At least I don't notice there's a, uh, any obvious issues from what I can tell. You can power this with, if I just switch it over, we've got a DC nine volts uh, plug, and we can also power it with six uh, C cell batteries that we can put in this compartment here. Let's crack it open and take a look inside. There you go, yeah, the head on that screw was going, and so the uh, flat head screwdriver seemed to fix that. So right off the bat, we have one issue. We have this wire that's come loose, which is the positive terminal of the battery. So that could very well be the issue because I was using the batteries to power this console. And so it could be that loose wire that was causing it not to work. There is no power indicator on this console, no LED or anything like that. So there's no idea, uh, no way of knowing if the console was actually getting power. So that's one thing to fix. Uh, I want to test this cable some more though, um, but before I do that, let's take off the board and just have a visual inspection of the top. So here we have the top side of the board. Uh, first thing I notice is these switches and that slider is definitely going to need a clean. I don't even want to touch that, it's disgusting. But looking at the capacitors, it doesn't look like anything has leaked. There's some like dried gunk here, I'm not sure that's anything to worry about. Um, that's probably just some glue, some flux, I don't know what that is, but it looks like it's quite old and probably done in the factory, I would imagine. And down here we have the RF unit, so the components in here help create the picture on the TV and I think it has this metal shield to prevent interference. Now you see that weird yellow stain, that's actually feels like at least wax. I have no idea why that's there or even if it should be there. But before I tackle that, let's get back to fixing that loose wire. So with that, I set about reconnecting that loose wire and testing the unit again, just to see if that fixes all of the problems. It could be a really straightforward fix. So before we power up the console, I just want to make sure everything's connected as it should be. So we have the positive terminal of the battery going from that white wire to the power jack, from that red wire then to the positive side of the board. Let's just check for continuity, make sure there's no loose connections there. There we go. So now let's check the negative side of the battery. So we have this black wire going to the 
power jack there. And inside the power jack, we have these two contacts that connect the black wire and the yellow wire together. And what it's designed to do is when you push in a power cable, it breaks those contacts apart. And I think it's designed to prevent you from using the batteries at the same time that you're using a power plug. So then obviously that yellow wire goes to the negative on the board. And we'll do a continuity test now. Right, we've got a connection problem there. And I think I know what the problem is. I've encountered the same problem on a previous fix with a handheld from the 1970s, 1980s that had a similar kind of connection. And basically I think what's happening is those contacts in the power jack are not connecting properly. So I cleaned it with isopropyl alcohol. I scraped back the metal a little bit and I got the pliers and bent it back into shape until it looked like the two sides were touching. So I did a continuity test just to make sure and that fixed the problem. Yes, and we have sound. Now where's that image? All right, we do have an image there. It's better than it was when it's just fuzzy gray static, but still the image is pretty terrible. Just wanna show you the collection of bug and bug parts I got free with this console. This was all inside this old 1970s Pong console. Lovely. Okay, so it's working. We have an image, albeit a very bad image. So I'm gonna start with the cable. Now, I've had a look at the cable for defects, obvious defects, breaks. There might be one, and I cannot tell visually from the outside, but looking at the cable, there's nothing obvious here. There is one obvious place where a break could occur, and that's at the cable relief. That tends to get pulled around a lot, but that looks okay visually. I tell you what doesn't look too great visually, and that's the end that's connected to the board. If you look, it's actually bent quite tight. It also feels a bit bumpy when I run my finger over it. So I'm gonna desolder that and take a closer look. We have quite a bit of coax cable to play with, so I'm just gonna cut off that part that looks bad just in case. Right, so I've done a little bit of an autopsy on that end part, and you can see the braided wire around the insulator. If I look at the end, there's some green oxidization there. That's what it looks like. Now, that might very well be responsible for causing those visual issues. We'll just have to wait and see. And before I go on, another thing I can do is test to see whether the rest of this coax cable is any good. So I'll switch to continuity mode, and I'm just touching the middle pin here and the outside pin with the other probe. Now, if you hear a beeping sound like that, that means there's a short somewhere in the cable as those two parts should be insulated from one another. But as you can see, there's no beeping, so I think we're good there. The other thing I wanna do is check that the cable runs to the full length without any breaks. So I attach one of my probes to the metal cylinder on the connector, and I touch the other probe to that braided cable that's attached to it. And you can see there's continuity, so that's a good sign. Then I'm gonna do the same now to the central pin, and then I'll touch the other probe to that central wire that's in that little insulated jacket. This one's a bit harder to do. And there we go. So both cables seem to run the length of the wire. So I'm assuming that this cable is probably good. So now being a bit more confident that the rest of this cable is okay, I stripped it back and attached it to the board. Then I gave it another test. And you can see the image is actually a bit better. So that oxidization that you saw, that green stuff, was probably causing some issues, although there is still some way to go. Okay, I'm just skipping ahead a bit here, just for the sake of the length of this video. And what I've done is I've attached a brand new coax cable just to eliminate the coax cable as the source of the error completely. And what I also did was take off this little shield that covers the RF components responsible for producing that image on screen. And here it is. Now, there's a few interesting things I noticed that I'm gonna point out to you here. So we have these two coils here, and I know they're partly responsible for tuning the frequency of the image that we see on screen. And I think they do this in factory and get it just right. And I noticed this waxy stuff covering them. So I had to look that up and apparently, because these parts are sensitive to movement and any movement could knock them out of tune, they cover them in this waxy material. And there's also, if you look inside here, there's also a bit of a sponge. And what that does, it helps it stay in place so it doesn't move around. 
Now if you remember earlier, I was wondering what some of this wax stuff was that was covering a bit of that metal shield as well as some of the board. Now I think I know what's happened. Things have got really hot, maybe it's a really hot day. It's melted the wax, which has dribbled all over the board. And those coils have been moved out of place, particularly the top one, which, which doesn't seem to be covered by much wax at all. So what I'm gonna do next is play around with that top coil, see if I can improve the picture and hopefully not completely break it. So I'm glad I recorded this next part because you might not believe me if I told you. So I was playing around with that top coil, not knowing what I was doing, just squeezing, prodding, poking, hoping to improve that image on the screen. And then the screen just went totally fuzzy and I thought I'd stuffed it, I'd broken the console and there's no going back. But then I took the remote control, changed the channel forward and then back again. And hey presto, it seemed to come on screen and it looks actually pretty good. Not 100%, but definitely playable. Then it's on to testing those controllers. Both analog sticks seem to work fine. I didn't have any problems moving those around. There wasn't any dead zones or anything like that, which is really good. And the game change feature also worked great on the console, no problems there. But the buttons didn't seem to work. At least sometimes they worked, sometimes they didn't. So I thought there might be an issue with the controllers. All right, now let's take a look at these controllers. I'm kind of glad there is an issue with these controllers actually because it gives me the opportunity to open them up and take a look inside. Okay, there we have the analog stick. Look at that. Look how nice that is. And I think on either side, the left and the top, we have little variable resistors. Okay, so um, the part we want is just behind this board. So let's take that off. Okay, let's see what's behind here. So the button pushes in this metal coil. And what do we have on the board? It looks like these two strips of wire. Right, and it connects to the back. Oh, I see what happens. Okay, so you've got these two points here and the metal plate touches that big wire there. When you press the button down, that makes contact with the little one which then shorts the two and causes a button press. Oh, and look, there's a little variable resistor here too, probably to adjust the sensitivity of those analog sticks. So what I did next was just simply clean that plate with some isopropyl alcohol. Also did the same thing to the wires and scraped back on the metal. Also applied just a little bit of solder to those wires there, just to hopefully improve the contact between the wire and the button itself. But even with that, I found that sometimes the buttons just didn't work. So what I did was I checked continuity in the controllers themselves, making sure that when I pressed the button down, there was continuity, which was the case. Then I checked it again at the board level. So I'm putting my probes here in continuity mode across the black and yellow wires, which are the two button wires. And there's no continuity, which is what we'd expect because I'm not pressing the button at this time. And then I turned on the auto serve switch. And what that will do, it should connect both buttons, so I did that. And when I did that, I found continuity between those two wires, which again is what we'd expect. It bridges those wires so that it auto serves each time. So long story short, I couldn't find an issue. Then I went back and play tested the console again. And I found out that the reason why it sometimes wasn't working was with, with the two player games with this console, both players needed to press the serve buttons at the same time. Now I was just pressing it on one controller and it wasn't working. So I think that was the reason for the issue. So the buttons actually did work in the first place. So now it's time to put it back together. But before I did that, I put the original coax cable back because I want this machine to be as original as possible. And seeing as the original coax cable seems to work just fine, then I put it back. I also tried to reapply as much of the wax as I could to that upper coil that I just fixed. So all I did was scrape the wax towards the coil and try to melt it with my soldering iron and coat those coils as much as I could. And then it was time for a clean. Now, a little fact, I was wondering why, you see that speaker grill, how it was so big, but they got this tiny piezo speaker in its place. Well, I looked at some images of some earlier versions of this console, and it actually does have a larger size speaker filling that whole speaker grill. 
And it's just in this version, a newer version I expect, that to cut costs, they've just included this tiny piezo speaker. So that's why it looks so small compared to the speaker grill. And there we go. So thankfully, reapplying that wax didn't knock those coils out of tune and the image still looks pretty decent. It's not 100% like I say, it's a bit on the darker side. So I've turned the TV brightness up a little bit. And there's a tiny bit of interference and fuzziness. Now that ghosting you see is actually due to the TV. Because it is an LCD TV, I think some ghosting is unavoidable with this older style console. So like I said, changing the games, you've got different games here, which doesn't change much. It just really changes a bunch of lines on screen. Is the console completely fixed? I'd say it's about 90% there. Like I said, the image could be a bit better, but I think the next step for that would be to do some kind of composite cable mod, which to tell you the truth, I don't have time for, nor do I have the skills and expertise. So that's it for this one. I actually really enjoyed fixing it. There's lots of different problems to solve, little mysteries like the wax, and I learned some new things in the process. I hope you did too, I hope you enjoyed the video. Like I say, if you did like it, giving it a thumbs up really helps. Check out my other content. If you like this kind of stuff, then you might wanna consider subscribing. Take care, and I hope to catch you in the next one.